Driving the spectacularly good Porsche 911 GT3 RS, it's hard to imagine how any 911 could ever deliver anything beyond its astounding levels of pace, telepathic feel and laugh out loud fun. Pound for pound, assuming you can get one for list price that is, it's one of the most astonishing cars on sale today and sits atop of perhaps the greatest model line in the history of sports cars. In short, it's the real deal. And yet, believe it or not, Porsche reckons that it's got at least two 911 models that go beyond its most outrageous road car. So, intrigued, we made our way to the famous Estoril circuit in southern Portugal for a chance to drive two 911s that you're unlikely to ever see anywhere on the public highway, namely the 911 GT3 Cup and GT3R. The motorsport equivalents of Stuttgart's iconic road car, this is what happens when engineers don't have to worry about things like comfort, refinement or even where your mobile phone will sit in the cabin. Even by the standards of the GT3 RS, these are 911s designed to go fast and nothing else. So, Porsche 911 992 Cup car. It's not often you get a look around one of these up close, so this should be pretty cool. It's now been changed so that previously it was 30% aluminium and 70% steel. They switched that ratio around to make it lighter than it was before. It now weighs in about 1260 kilograms. So that makes a big difference with performance, as does about an extra 25 brake horsepower. It's now making 503-ish. It's a little bit less actually than a 911 GT3 RS, but nobody's counting, especially with the difference in weight. But it wasn't all about making it faster because after all, this car has just got to race other Porsches. It hasn't got to race Ferraris and Lamborghinis. That's what the GT3R is for. So they wanted to make it easier to use. And a really cool example of that, I think at least, is that when they take the engine cover off the back here, and that's something that you can't do on the 911 road car anymore, it's a shame. But when they take it off, previously on the 991, you'd have to put it on the garage floor somewhere and everyone would trip over it. And that was a shame because it's actually quite expensive. But now there's these little kind of rivets where you can hang it off. So you've got your engine cover hanging off the rear wing, which I think is a really nice piece of well, tidying things up. That rear wing, it's a swan neck spoiler. I think it's adjustable through about 11 different settings for different aeros. So here at Estoril, you've got a big long straight and some slow corners. So you probably want a little bit less wing, but you can change that all around. The rear wheels, they're wider than they were before. I think it's now 13 inches at the back and it's 12 inches at the front. So that's a bit of a difference and it makes the car a little bit friendlier to drive because the 991 apparently was infamous for how difficult it was to drive quickly. They said that if you could drive that thing fast, you can drive any racing car fast. So this is potentially a bit easier. There's lots of carbon all over the cars. I'm sure you can imagine the door, for example, it's incredibly light. That weighs about four kilograms and it absolutely feels it. And then on the inside, you'll see some shots of it now, they've completely changed the whole cabin area. So you've got a massive, it's about 10.25 inch digital dashboard screen. It's really clear, super nicely laid out. And also the steering wheel is changed from the old round steering wheel and now it's Le Mans or Formula One style, one where you hold on to both sides, but they've got a little bit of carbon at the bottom, which apparently was for the gentleman drivers to have a bit extra to hold on to if they start to lose the car and they can gather it back up. Last thing to mention, the 911 GT3 RS doesn't have any boot space because of course you've got that central radiator, but because this is based on the GT3, it's got a different radiator configuration. There is actually a bit of boot space in there. Not that you're gonna use it, but it's there. Now let's go and drive it before I get blown away. <laughs> So 
I've driven a lot of 911 road cars. But this is my first time in a 911 racing car. Oh, you're thinking, how different can it be? Well, that's just gone out the window, leaving the pit lane. My God, the responses. Wow. Oh, the throttle. So sensitive. The brakes. Oh, what incredible feel. You've obviously got to trail brake a lot because, well, it's a 911. And it tends to be a little bit light on the nose. But when you've got such a lovely brake pedal, that is not a chore. Oh, right. Good straight, 230 kilometers an hour into sixth gear. The braking is sensational. Such good feel. We've got a little bit of ABS going on, just to make it a bit easier for us modern pros. But I'm trying my best to threshold brake and not activate it. But when it is coming on, it's a really nice, subtle ABS. It's not like a road car ABS. Big thing is just learning to trust the rear end because there is so much traction and you need to drive it in a way where you trust the rear end because that's one of this car's biggest strengths. So if you don't trust it, you're not getting the most out of it. So this is the 911 GT3R. So whereas the cup car pretty much exclusively, but not entirely, races against other cup cars, so other Porsche 911s, this thing takes on Audi, BMW, Lamborghini, Mercedes AMG, at races like Le Mans and the Nürburgring 24 hour. In fact, it's gonna make its debut at Le Mans in 2024. Now it costs from 511 thousand euros excluding taxes and options so probably quite a lot more than that when it gets down to it so with this car what they wanted to do going forward into the next few years was not necessarily make it outright quicker because in this type of racing the balance of performance can mean that if you are too quick they'll make it slower which is a bit of a pain but they wanted to make it easier to drive fast for longer so speaking of that the aerodynamics especially on the rear end, that's been changed and tweaked to make it easier on the rear tires and also make it more stable and more drivable. The engine, it's not four liters, it's 4.2 flat six. They've bored it out. It's now making 557 brake horsepower. So quite a lot more, almost 60 brake horsepower more than the 911 GT3 Cup car. Another thing, and I'm not sure if you can see it from here, but the rear wheels have been pushed back and that's extended the wheelbase by about 48 millimeters. So the amount that you can play around with the base 911 in this kind of category is actually quite a lot because that's quite a fundamental change to how the car drives and handles. Now, the engine itself has been banked by about five and a half degrees to allow for a larger, more generous diffuser under the rear end. And they've also moved the aircon compressor and the alternator forward. So it's about a meter forwards of the engine. The suspension, it is multi-link at the rear and it's double wishbone at the front. The brakes, they're AP racing, they're six pot at the front and they are four pot at the back. And the entire chassis is an aluminium and steel composite with the actual parts that are bolted to it mainly made out of carbon. So the whole car weighs in, depending on the balance of performance, that's such a big thing when you're racing one of these, is 1,250 kilograms. So it's a bit of a beast. Really looking forward to seeing how it differs to the 911 GT3 Cup car, because there are some clear differences on paper, but how that translates onto the track, that's what I want to go and find out. So now 
join the 911 GT3R. And I wonder how different can it be? Because of course it's still a 911 racing car. It's still on slicks. It's still rear engine. But the first impression is that it's a lot smoother. Feels broader on the track. Feels like a bigger car almost. Seating position also feels a bit different. Like I'm lower down, more laid back. Maybe more like a formula car. Maybe a bit more in a straight line, but you can't really tell. It's quieter though, I can hear myself think. It still makes an awesome noise. Just feels more settled. Those big wide tyres certainly helping with that. Oh. It rides over the bumps a lot more smoothly. Oh. Wow, the steering so responsive and the car just does all you ask of it. You can feel my neck muscles working even on moderately warm tyres. Probably just because I'm not as fit as uh, I maybe could be. Oh, so much more grip out of the last corner. Pedal feel isn't as nice as the cup car. They usually run this, the R with ABS in the cup car they don't. It's a lot longer travel on the pedal. The throttle is a bit easier to use, not quite as sensitive. Don't think there's as much mechanical grip as in the cup car. Doesn't feel that way anyway. Oh. Yeah, I can see why this is the car you'd rather use endurance race. You can feel the aero working in the quicker bits. Pushing the back of the car down with that mahoosive rear wing. Then the slow stuff, the responses. Even when you drag it over the curves. The 911 GT3 Cup and GT3R move the game on from even the mightiest 911 road cars. When it comes to outright performance, a GT3 RS may be close to the former, yet the raw and visceral experience plus the skill required to gain the performance out of them is on another level. And while it's perhaps not hard to imagine the joy of driving two examples of Porsche's enviable stable of racing cars, what also stands out is what makes them so commercially successful. It's not something we usually think of when it comes to motorsport, but like with its road cars, Porsche has gone to considerable lengths to make its racing cars as appealing as possible, not just to the pro drivers, but also those that pay for and run the cars. Speaking to members of the racing team that wasn't owned by Porsche, who were running the GT3R on the day, they confirmed that the 911s are often quicker and easier to fix than rival cars, something that counts for a huge amount in endurance racing. So, next time you're wondering why Porsche's customer motorsport presence is still so vast, then it's worth remembering that there's more to an ideal racing car than just raw speed.